Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 217 for July 1st, 2019. Greetings, folks, and Welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast that's by, for, and about working musicians here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Las Gatas, California. It's Paul Kent. How goes it, Mr. Kent? It goes pretty good, man. We've got Fourth of July week. I have a busy week coming up. I got I got a four in a row. Big shows, big Fourth of July show. You nice. playing Fourth of July? No, I actually have this weekend off. We um uh, Fish is playing in, at Fenway on July 5th and 6th, and our kids actually told us they wanted to go with us, so we're making a, a family weekend away of it. Um, so, You're going to stay in the city? Yeah, we'll stay down in Boston. I was able to get hotel rooms walking distance from Fenway Park with, oh, uh, with cool hotel points, no less. So, yeah, it was a total win. Yep. So, that yeah, should be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Something to, something to do with the kids. It's uh, You know, those moments are... Uh, fleeting. Yeah, fleeting. Fewer and, and fewer. Yeah, we're all we're all really aware of that, though. And so when we have these opportunities, we really just kind of, you know, we make it happen. But but we all know that, like, yeah, things are constantly changing in, in our everyone. Our kids are becoming more and more independent, which, of course, means Lisa and I therefore have to become more and more independent, too. Sure. Yeah. yeah that's the part how, that, that's that's interesting. But yeah. how much age difference between your daughter and your son? Two years to the day, because, Got it. you know, we drummers time things, evidently. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's a unique feat. That's better than a click track there. Uh, you know, we said when we were having kids, we we're like, we would love to have a boy and a girl two years apart. And then, you know, maybe a few months after our son was born, which was our second, we looked at each other we're like, we really need to be careful what we wish for here. Because um, at the timing of that was like, yeah, man, yep, same birthday, two years apart. So there you go. Yeah. Hey, I have a new um, a new wish list for an interview subject. Have you heard of this guy, Jacob Collier? Why do I know that name? I think he's kind of getting a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, awareness right now. So he's this he's this young composer, singer, multi instrumentalist, right? Okay. And um, he, he recently published. Nick actually turned me on to him. He published this thing where he does nine voices singing meet the Flintstones is just one of the things he's done many things and not all of them are, are, are satire parody sure. type things. Sure. Sure. But the tightness of the harmonies and the ear and uh, Nick was telling me that the, he grew up in a musical family. The, you know, there was a music room that had many instruments. He can play them all now. I mean, he's just one of those kind of guys. Yep. Sure. And, um, but mostly, I mean, his chops are really interesting, but his sense of harmony is what is, kind of extraordinary nice so if you could post the link for the for the the flintstones video the youtube of that i think people would get a kick out of it um but uh i i don't you know he's not like a major pop star at this point in time i wonder if he's gettable and you know if we could talk to him about anybody's you know, gettable of course uh, we just gotta get, we should get more with then yes yeah so all right you want to reach out to uh jacob or you want me to um i'll take first shot at it okay there you go Cool. All right. Yeah, yeah. No, that's that would. He sounds like a fascinating person. I would love to chat with him. That sounds good. You know, and that's that whole thing about there are people who are born special. There are people that work really hard. Yeah. And and levels of success. You know, you got to add luck into both of those things and levels Absolutely. of success in whatever endeavor you have. Some people are born special and don't work really hard and. Some of them still succeed because of luck and some of them. I was just going to say, yeah, being born special is is perhaps it, it's a it's a blessing and a curse. Right. Because it, you think, oh, I don't have to work very hard. I have you know, I have the ability to whatever, play these instruments or sing these things or do, whatever it is, you know. But the reality is that you can be uh, an unknown uh, natural talent. And unless you develop that into something that's marketable. And then also go and market it, like work really hard. It might not matter what you were born with. In fact, well, luck is the great equalizer, right? Totally. Luck, you don't know where it's going to strike. And remember, as in all situations in life, there's not just one aspect to achieving a goal, right? Like Correct. you said, 
you know, there's hard work, but there's hard work in chops. There's hard work in marketing. There's hard work in songwriting. There's hard work in, you know, there, there's all sorts of avenues where that sun may shine on you and, and lift you to a new place. Uh, you got to kind of go, <laughs> go through life with humility and wonder and, you know, just keep doing the best you can, using the skills you have, developing where you want to go. And then, you know, hopefully if you do all your stuff, then, you know, the karma gods will shine down on you. Yeah, see, I don't necessarily believe in luck. I, I believe in in happenstance, right? Like there are there are things that you cannot control and an opportunity will be presented to you, right? But if you have if you are not prepared to leverage that opportunity, it doesn't matter that that opportunity presented itself, right? That someone else came to you or it was just like the right timing or whatever. If you're not ready to jump on it, man, then then that's that. So like, yes, there's 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 luck in that sense that these opportunities just, you know, an opportunity might appear for you or many might appear for you. But if you're not prepared, even if it's just being emotionally prepared to say, yep, I can jump on this. I can do this right now. Then it then, you know, it passes you by. So you got to be even if even if you're just naturally talented, you still got to be ready to do it. Well, you, you know. got to recognize this, recognize the opportunity. So that's well, and a lot of times it's the hard work that that I'll kind of opens your eyes to that. For me, it certainly is. Y you know, I used to think, wow, it's weird. Like if I'm playing my drums all the time, even if I'm just home, like practicing, then suddenly I'm I I find these offers from bands or you know th projects or whatever. That's what I want to do. And the same is true in business. And it finally dawned on me. It's like. I'm not like manipulating the universe somehow. I'm manipulating my perspective on things by playing every day or whatever, three days a week, however often it is, by doing something with repetition and intention, you kind of open your mind and focus your mind rather on that thing. And so you'll notice stuff that may have otherwise just passed What's you it? by. So. I think by focusing your mind, you are manipulating the universe. I think they're the same thing. It's I think. the same you thing. Know. Correct. Correct. You're yes. You're focusing so that you're going to notice. Hey, wait a minute. There's an opportunity over there, which if you, you know, had your head down doing something else, you might not pay attention to. So, That's yeah. Right. Yeah. Hey, we got a um, we got an email from Kevin after talking about tempos last week. And uh, and he shares, man, he shares so many great things. I'm just going to read his thing and then and then we'll probably deconstruct for a few minutes here. Uh, he says regarding tempos, I've gone the whole spectrum on this in the early days of my current band, as well as with previous bands going all the way back to when I started gigging in the eighties, we always had the drummer responsible for the tempo. Uh, my band in the nineties would occasionally play to sample loops, but no click. So the drummer would have to pay extra attention to keep us in time with the loop. And he also triggered them if we got out of step so he could just turn it off and turn it back on or whatever he says. Uh, with my current band, over time, the responsibility and methods changed. Back in 2006, we had a bass player join who had a much better sense of tempo than our drummer did. So for about three years while he was with us, he drove the tempo. Then we switched bass players in 2009 and have the same person today. And that responsibility reverted back to the drummer where it continues today. Our current drummer is also a drum teacher and swears by using a click. So two years ago, we went all in with using the click. The drummer uses an iPad, so he has both visual click and audible click. As long as we have our own in-ear monitor system, we can all hear the click if we choose. It's on a separate track. He says, though, in the rare instances we can't, our drummer still has a visual click and then will be uh, much more pronounced with, say, using his hi-hat to keep us in sync. He says an example of this is uh, they're in Wisconsin and sometimes they play tailgates for the Green Bay Packer games mm -hmm. and the NFL doesn't allow use of unapproved wireless systems on game day. So they uh, either have to be wired in ears or no in ears. So that's one of those scenarios. He says all of this together. He says, I used to be against the click thinking it took away from how songs tend to breathe. However, I've come completely to the other side after listening to show recordings recently. The past few years, the band sounds much more consistent and under control with how it plays. Plus, in hindsight, in hindsight, we started to realize that when the bass player and our previous drummers would have a few beers, their sense of tempo would change. And I've jokingly called it racing fuel. Now, we had a previous drummer fill in late last year who doesn't use a click. And really, we noticed how over the night things would get incrementally faster as the show went along. You can argue with each other about what the quote unquote right tempo is, but you cannot argue with a click. 
The other bonus of using a click has been uh, with the video recordings of our shows. We can pick good audio track from, say, one show and different video shots from other shows. And everything just magically syncs up perfectly, which mm. makes making a promo video so much easier. He says, I hope this is the kind of feedback you're looking for. So, yeah, uh, absolutely. This is great. And for anybody else, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. We'd love to hear from you. But um yeah, there's there's a lot here. I'm I'm not um I'm with him on on the click. Uh I, I don't I, I won't say it's universally better. And actually he's not saying it's universally better either. It's better for his scenario, certainly. And and I would agree with that. Some bands, some different scenarios playing to a click, it can be a huge stress reliever. Knowing that, like, especially if you don't know the tunes, if you're if it's a new scenario or, you know, you've got different singers coming in or whatever. It's great to be able to just say, OK, yeah, there's the tempo. That's it. We don't there's no guessing game on stage. Adrenaline doesn't factor in. And uh, and you can just play. And I as a drummer I actually love playing to a click. And it, I, I grew up playing to a click. So like it's not a foreign thing for me. It's not a weird thing. But playing fills and not having to also think, hey, where's the time so that I don't rush myself out of this fill or whatever, being able to just kind of, you know, dive off the, the ledge, if you will, and follow the click back in. That's an awesome thing. I love it. So. All right. But let's be real here. A yeah. guy who has been 20 years a drummer has never played to a click. Can you learn to play to a click once you've been a drummer for a long time? I think so. I think anybody can. Yeah. I And I think I mean, if you if you think about it, you probably already have some experience playing to a click um, in a sense. Right. Because if you're following another musician, you are playing to their click. If you're used to playing along with records, even if they're older records or records now that aren't recorded to a click, you're still playing along with someone else who, you know, is is your click, whether it's a, a, a consistent click or a modulating click like that. That's a whole different story. But, you know, the the ability to listen to something and play along with it is a skill that certainly a 20 year musician uh, would have. So, yeah, I I think uh, not would have c can learn. Well, but that's what I'm saying. If you've been playing for 20 years, unless you've just been in your, you know, in your basement playing alone you've been playing with other people's clicks you know whether it's an official click or a, a a musician you know who's driving the groove or like you're used to listening and hearing time cues that aren't coming from inside your own head mm -hmm. uh, so i think so i i think that's i think it's a skill that can be now to migrate that to actually playing with a click versus playing along with say a recording of another band where you also hear the drums and that sort of thing. I, yes, I think that can, that skill can be, you know, sharpened and honed. And, and so yes, learned. Yeah, I think so. I don't think it's all that hard. I, I mean, it takes time, you know, you just got to do it. And then, and then it becomes a, a thing that maybe like me, you'll actually start to like it. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I can't, that part I can't, uh, I can't tell you, but yeah, I think you can learn it. Sure. I don't think it's that hard. I, I would say to people in that position, hearing the click can be foreign and therefore maybe intimidating, but also just uncomfortable. Right. So I would say if you want to, if you aren't, if that is uncomfortable to, for you, I would say initially don't use like a traditional click maybe set up a drum machine or, you know, use your computer or your phone. I mean, all these things are so available to us now uh, to just play like a simple, you know, like eighth notes on the hi hat, one and three on the kick, two and four on the snare. So you hear a drum groove happening, just a chat, you know, that and then play along to that and and get used to the idea of playing along to that thing that a computer is generating, but sounds like maybe something a little more human. And then you can just distill that down to maybe, you know, take the hi-hat out of it. So you're not hearing eighth notes anymore. You're hearing quarter notes, you know, kick, dun, cat, dun, 
God, you know, and then maybe that's maybe that, there you are right. There's quarter notes. And then you can actually get interesting with it and take out the two and the four so that you're giving your spell yourself more room to breathe. That can be informative because you, you start to learn. Oh, OK. When I do this, I speed up because, look, there's the there's the kick on three that that came a little later than I was expecting, <laughs> you know, those sorts of things. But mm. um, but yeah, I think I think it's learnable. Yeah, I think so. Good. Yeah, I am um, on the uh, do you. I, so I'm, I'm curious what like do you is a click something that's part of has ever been part of your musical world? I know you guys don't play with one on stage with the house rockers, but just like personally, when you when you just jam in your house, when you practice on your own, do you ever play to a click or is that a new thing? Um, I, I practice to a metronome on great. Not often, but I, I have and do. So yes. Occasionally. We've gotten to the point in the House Rockers, Russ is a stickler for time. And um, he, you know, if, if you tell him 116, he can get us to 116, you know, in his head. Yep. And um, so he has a lot of charts and, and be per minute markings. And so he kind of has that. Now, again, I count off most of the songs. That's right. You in, said that last week. In the House Rockers. So, yep. so, you know, it's on me for many of them. But even sometimes, you know, I'll count and then, you know, he'll adjust, you know, yeah. as we as we get in. So, yeah, of course. But no, the band live has never, ever, ever, ever played to a click. Yeah. yeah. When was the last time you, you played live to a click? Oh, it would have been a madhouse earlier this year. We do it pretty it. frequently. Yeah, because they'll have triggers in tracks or uh, whatever or sequence things in, in tracks. So we play along to a click so that. Uh, you know, if we need a whatever, some, uh, you know, a keyboard patch or a, uh, an event or something that's happening, we can have that. Even if someone on stage, if you know, we don't have a musician in the band that, that can play whatever that instrument is. Um, we've had we've had horn parts if they're not really like I mean, sometimes we've had live horns if it really matters for the show. But other times we've had like, you know, a horn stab here or there can come mm -hmm. out of a, or a keyboard stab for some of those eighties things or whatever. Um, you know, a click sometimes works really well for, for that. But again, the nice part in Madhouse is, is a perfect example. If I don't know the tune tempo is the hardest part to come up with, like in the moment, right? Like I don't have any extra time to feel where the song is. It's like now is when the song is starting. And uh, just cause it, because of the way those shows flow. So to have a click, it's like, oh, great. OK, I know exactly where we need to be because there it yeah. is. Yeah, uh, it was, you know, I went and saw Bowling for Soup on uh, Saturday night. One of my favorite bands to see live. They are forever entertaining. They, they uh, they're just funny guys. And mo like I, I would say a good 30 percent of the show is just them cutting up on stage. And then and then they do play songs occasionally. But mm -hmm. um, after talking about tempos last week, I was sort of hyper aware of it, but everybody in my family sort of noticed they have this tendency. And my guess is that they, they are aware of it and it might be a conscious, it might have even originally been a conscious decision when they hit the chorus of not every song, but a lot of songs, they will lean into the tempo hard and maybe mm -hmm. like instantly increase five beats per minute. But by the time the chorus ends, they're back to where, they uh, they started. So it'll be like the first half of the chorus is at this like racing kind of thing. And then they slowly like ease back so that by the time they're they're back in the verse, it doesn't seem like they slowed down for the verse. But it's this right. constant shift and pull. And it was it was really like they're masters at it. And they would but it's do a it. style, right? Absolutely. It's, it's a, yeah, it's a it's a you think it's a collective band feel that they discovered as they were writing songs that this made their songs have a certain feel to them that was unique to them? Or do you think the the leader of the band is calling that? Or how do you arrive at a place like that? Yeah, I wonder how you arrive at a place like that. Well, they play everything faster live and they know that. I've seen them, you know, bring up like a guest guitarist or somebody like out of the audience on stage to play a tune. And before they start the tune, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll ask him, like, do you know this song? Like, you know, they'll, they'll like basically, mm -hmm. you know, they don't bring a contract out, but they make this guy commit, you know, within an inch of his life that, yeah, I'm not going to screw up your song. Right. OK, mm -hmm. you know the song. And then they'll tell him, hey, listen, uh, we play this way faster than the record. Just follow <laughs> Gary, the drummer, you know. So they are aware that they are doing these things faster than they than they wrote them um, or than they originally recorded them. But, um, yeah, my guess is that that. Uh, that kind of thing where they lean into the chorus really hard. I, I, my guess is it happened 
once, at, you know, it was happy accident kind of thing. And then they were like, OK, wait a minute. Like, there's something to this because it it didn't surprise anyone on stage. And it was jarring. Like my son was standing next to me. And uh, as soon as it happened the first time, we both looked at each other like, whoa, like they just took off. And then the second chorus came and it was like, OK, wait a minute. They did it again. Like and no one on stage flinched. This is just how they play, you know, that song or whatever it is. So I, yeah. I wonder if it's just a combination of their vibe together. Probably that, that would make most sense to me. Right. Yep. Like like they're all hyper focused on bringing an original tune to, to life. And then all of a sudden you find, oh, this this kind of makes it pop. It sounds doesn't sound like anybody else. Right. And right. And so yep. then all of a sudden you have a, a unique style and you've got your own thing. Yeah, I, I agree. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was good. It was good. Um, Pre-show, we were talking about wireless and Kevin's uh, Kevin's note about sometimes not being able to have wireless reminded me of this. So you, you've got it, I, as I've been watching on Facebook, you've got more than half of your band on in-ears now. Is that right? We have seven and a half. Right. <laughs> so we have now we have all five horns. Wow. That's on in ears, yep. Simon and I, you know, I, I don't have a monitor, so I have to make my inners work. Even if it's just one ear, yep. Even if it's just my vocals in there, I noticed that um, about Bowling for Soup too. They they played with two other bands, Real Big Fish and a band called Nerf Herder. And Bowling for Soup happened to have the third, the last slot of the night. And when they came out, there were no wedges on stage. It was like, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, uh, yeah. And, and then Russ is kind of in between. He's trying to get used to him. Trying to get his mix down and and um, you know get comfortable. So he's, he's have, so have him call me. I, I I'm happy to talk him through the things I've you got learned. it. Yeah, that'd be great. So you know, really, there are eight wireless ear in ears. There are five wireless horn mics. Keep count thirteen. Uh, Simon and I fourteen, fifteen for our guitars. And your vocal mic wireless. is wireless too. Uh, not not currently, but could be right. Okay, so, so potentially 16. sixteen. Yeah. And, you know, th- we often have times we have the horns have a uh, some have sure some have Samson wireless units. And I, we find that we are having some compatibility, you know, some 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 knock it on each other. So uh, the horns often will have to rescan their frequencies. You know, they, they most of these new units have automatic scanning. Yep. Um, but it seems like, you know, you and I have somewhat of a background in data networking. You know, this is Wi-Fi and wireless, you know, communications, um, it, it, it's a thing. There's a science to it. I mean, oh, yeah. in different size stages. And then on top of that, you don't know what the heck's going on in any room that you're in. I was right? going to say, there's a, a science to it, but you don't get to know all the data. That's right. right. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, mostly for us, it's a question of turn on. We'll often hear some really weird sound that indicates that there's interference. And then you figure out who that is. And then... And then they go rescan and there's this little dance that gets done on, on at least half the gigs, maybe more, where we have to figure it out. It's almost always a horn mic. Um, uh, that's usually the sense. And so it must have something to do with the uh, interference between the Samson units and the Shure units. Yeah. My in-ears are pretty consistent. My guitar doesn't have dropouts. I have line six. Um, uh, Simon has sh- has Sony wireless. Um, so there's a lot of manufacturers at play here, you know, and how accurate they are staying in their in their individual bandwidths is to be known. But it's that's a lot of wireless. And it's a lot of, you know, potential troubleshooting if something's not going right. If something. Yeah, that's the thing I, I have. I totally understand how and why a band gets to a point where it, like yours, you've got, you know, five different brands and, and styles of microphones and transmitters and all that stuff. But this is one of those scenarios where, uh, you know, standardizing on one makes your life way easier because that auto scanning often is going to be worse for you than especially in a scenario like this. I don't know that I would use auto scanning. I would define people on specific channels. And if one person is having a problem because of interference in the club, you can move that to another channel that you know is not going to currently be taken up by any of your stuff, right? Well, that's so, essentially what happens, though. So we determine which guy is having the, the problem. Yep. And he auto scans to another frequency. Sure. Right? As opposed sure. to self select another frequency. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it, the nice part is if you're if you're each on a specific frequency at every gig, 
you will begin to learn which ones of those frequencies are the bad ones. And, and you just say, OK, look, whatever it is, channel five, I, I mean, whatever, you know, X number of hertz. Uh, this one, you know, we've had like Tim was assigned to this one. And Tim is the one that seems to be having problems. If we're going to have problems, he's the first one to have an issue. OK, let's get off of that frequency and let's not put anyone on that frequency ever. Let's just leave a hole there. And you really do need to kind of chart it out and say, OK, yep, here's the address space. Here's this. And and you could then also get like a, a spectrum analyzer, right, that when you walk into a room before anybody turns on any of their own stuff, you turn on the spectrum analyzer and see, OK, where do we have something transmitting? Great. Johnny, you're going to have a problem tonight. Why don't you move to, you know, channel X and and then boom, then you're there. Are there that, apps that do that? Um. There might be for Android. iOS doesn't let third party apps talk to the the radio at that level. Um, your phone probably I mean, most of these things live in the same range as like Wi-Fi. If the good ones do. Um, but but some of them don't. So, yeah, you it, you're but like an Android phone, it's possible that it, you could have a spectrum analyzer app that that's actually looking at what the radio is hearing. Uh, but not on iOS, at least not on, on jailbroken iOS. But. Well, I, you know, I've said this a couple shows ago. It would be great if there was an agreed upon standard for wireless. Well, there and, is. And, and it was built into more gear. In the same way, right. you know, you can plug right. in a you know, quarter inch jack. Why not? Why not just make it a build to order type thing where you can build in yep. you know, a transmitter to your, into your guitar? Well, the other thing is, if if one piece of advice I would give to Russ, your drummer, is... Don't go wireless. Use wired in ears. Mm. I I've been doing that for a very long time, and it's so much better. In yeah, fact, he doesn't go anywhere. Right, he doesn't go anywhere. And in Fling, Aaron uh, is the the other one that is on in ears now uh, and has been for a while. And he also goes wired. I can give him wireless. I have my old Sure Wireless unit, but he's like, I don't want to. I don't go anywhere. I don't mind having a cord. You know, he just kind of ties it to his belt or whatever, and he's good to go. And and then that way, you know, there's no wireless interference to deal with, no batteries to mess with. Sure. You know, it's like if you're not going anywhere, th I would say go wired 100 percent of the time. Uh, Makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One piece of advice, a tip for anyone mm -hmm. that has any kind of wire to plug into on stage, but especially helpful for me behind the drums when I first went um you know, to wired in ears and started kind of getting my whole rig together. I was like, Oh, okay. Uh, you know, I bought some like long extension cables in case I need to, you know, in case the mixer or whatever is far away. So I have like these 25 foot, you know, headphone extension cables, essentially. It's like, okay, great. And I put what I do is so you might as well talk about the, 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 the way that it works for me. So I have my, my in ears, which are currently my ultimate ears, uh, pro 11s ambience. Right. And then I run those down my back, you know, usually inside my shirt just because it makes life easier. And then I use I, I go on Amazon or whatever. I can find a link for them and I find an inline attenuator. They're cheap. Buy them cheap. They're going to break. Uh, it's fine. Just be ready to throw them away and have extras. But just a little thing that has a headphone jack on one end and a headphone plug on the other and a volume knob in the middle. And not only does it work great as a, an attenuator, so you can control, you know, how much or how little of the signal you get, but I tie that thing to my belt loop so that I've got something on me. If the cable gets pulled, it's not yanking on my ears, right? I'm good to go. So I plug my, my in-ears into one end of the attenuator. I tie it to my belt loop and then, uh, and then the other end plugs into this cable that comes across, uh, you know, across the stage from wherever it needs to come from. Which might be really close if my headphone amp is close to me, but sometimes it's easier to put it by the mixer or whatever and get a headphone amp with a limiter in it or use a limiter in the mixer so you're not blowing your ears out. Uh, I used to use, I, when I first did this, I bought black cables because they hide on stage, you know, and that's really nice. And then I walked on stage uh, one night very shortly after I had just bought like three black cables and realized why they were going to uh, live as spares only. Because stages tend to be dark when you walk onto them and fishing around trying to find that cable to plug in as the lead singer or, you know, the click is coming to count in the first tune ain't 
fun. So now <laughs> I use bright white cables for my headphones and it's never been a problem. I walk out, I can see it, I grab it, I plug it in. I'm good to go. <laughs> so That's yeah. pretty funny. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The yeah, simplest yeah. thing. The simplest thing. But yeah, it was. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Never, never. It was those dark cables seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's not easy to find white extension cables. I'll, I'll put a link in the show notes too. If I can, if I can find, you know, the most recent ones I bought or whatever, and I'll probably actually wind up buying a few more because it's always time, but, um, but you know, those headphone extension cables are good. So, yeah. Hey, so I had a fun gig on Friday night. We played a big winery event, big stage sound was awesome. I posted actually one video uh, an, an audience video on the house rockers Facebook page. If someone wants to check it out. Oh, nice. And the only nice. reason, the only reason I pointed to that, it is like the vocals are so crisply cleanly on top of the mix and nice. everything. Just sat, like I play a little, you know, single note line in that and you can hear it just pop out really. I mean, it was really a great mix, but at this gig, which, and we've done this gig for years. So people at this gig know us um, for some reason, the, the, the gates of hell opened up and it was, it was request a Rama. Now, some of the requests were songs that people have heard us play before, which is kind of flattering. If someone you know wants you to play something that they've heard you play. Yeah. That's then, really nice. Yeah. That is really nice. But then there was also, you know, one woman came up and said, can you play a cha-cha? All right. You know, no. Uh, oh, some yeah. woman came up with her phone and just, she didn't even know the name of the song. She just showed me the phone and said, can you play this? Oh. And it, it was, you know, something that we didn't play. And there were probably, I'd say, two requests for things that we played, but we haven't played in a long time. And we had to not do them because nobody felt comfortable doing them. Sure. And then four requests for things that weren't even either our style or in our book in any way, shape or form. So I was, it got me to wondering, you know, what happens when people... It's always weird to me that someone comes up and makes a request because that to me, that assumption, like the heck with what everybody else wants, what I want, you know, will you pay attention to that? That's, right. that's a little bit interesting to me. And I guess that's not really how they're thinking about it. I mean, they're kind of thinking about it, man, I bet if I ask them to play this, everybody will love it and I will be so right. You know, I will be, yes. I will be so spot on. That's probably what's transacting, but well, it, I oh wonder. No, it's mostly that I've had a few drinks and I love brown eyed girl. I really <laughs> hope they play brown eyed girl. That's usually what it goes to. Like, I don't think that's it's funny. a whole lot more than that. And that's, you know, that's okay. Right. You that's know. Okay. But if you don't play a request, what do you think transacts? Do, they, do you think they go back and go, those jerks, I asked them nicely and they didn't play my song or do you, you know, I, I guess they didn't get to it or like, why wouldn't they do what I asked them to do? I mean, and like, do you, do you lose a fan if you don't play a, a potential patron, if you don't play a request? And do you honestly say, like I say, I'm sorry, we don't know that one. Right. I hate right. saying that, you right. know, but I say, you know, that's not one we do. And if it's one that we've done in the past, I, I do have to go figure out if it's one that's in our current book, then it's, you know, I'll call that's it easy. Nine, sure. nine times out of 10. If it's one that we haven't played in a while, I ha then I'd say to them, oh, we, we do play that. We haven't done it in a while. I got to see if the guys know it, remember it still. And it really just comes down to that. Yep. I don't know. I guess that's better than than saying nothing. I guess that's better, even though it feels like some kind of a fail like you know should should great musicians be able to pull any song out of their butt to some degree and and make it make well it usable okay so that's a good question because should any you know musician worth their salt be able to pull you know especially a general business tune which is what most of these types of requests are although I, you know, I know we all can immediately think of the weird ones where it's like, yeah, no, we're not going to. Well, I'll give you a good example. The one that the woman brought up to me where she showed me the phone was get down on it by cool and the gang, which could be a general business one in some cases. Right. Yeah, but if you Certainly. don't know the form of that tune, like yeah. that tune is funk. It's all about the form and and right. it and the groove. So like to me, that's that's way more difficult than a Sweet Home Alabama or something, you know, like that. Um, it, it, and so but let's say. Yes. At some level, any decent musician should be able to sort of jump in on the middle of a tune. If you give him, you know, him or her the chord charts or the middle of a tune. Well, in on a song. One time through. One time through. Right. But for the entire band to be doing that, so it's one thing if you say, guys, I've played this one before. Follow me. Right. And you give them the chords and it's like, I'm going to sing it. Uh, you know, when I when I go to the chorus, they know follow you to the chorus like that kind of thing. That's fine. Maybe it it that's one level of this. The other level is 
everyone in the band has heard the song because it's one of those tunes, but no one has played it. And that in and of itself is usually a litmus test for like, maybe there's a reason this song hasn't ever been played by, you know, one of the four five, 10 of us on stage. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like seriously, you know, and, and, and that, but that's another level of this. And then there's the song you've never heard before The you know, somebody comes up and wants, you know, their favorite country song and you're not in, you know, nobody in your band is a country fan. And so it's like, yeah, we're, we're the wrong band to play that. And, and all right, that, let, let's try this with me then. Well, but each Would of you- those, each of those comes with, a different level of, of delivery. And if your band is delivering, you know, A's all night long, even if it's, you know, the song and nobody else in the band does, and they're going to follow you like at best, that's a B, maybe a B minus. If it's, you can get, you get one a night that you can do that. For. Yeah. You can't be doing that all night unless it, that's exactly what you are doing all night. Like when I play with, with Maddie in, in chafed or in monkey fist, when Matt Langley plays, He's he just sort of knows enough about every song that he's ever heard. He's just got a weird memory and way he processes things yeah. that he's just capable of this. And so we just follow him all night and the crowd is in on it. Like they know that they are trying to stump the band. So when they call out Ario Speedwagon and and we play it, they aren't actually expecting it to sound like it did when Ario Speedwagon played it, right? They the bar is set differently when it's this interactive thing. But when it's one person that's like, will you please in the middle of your perfectly honed set play, <laughs> you know, this tune that means a lot to me that you probably only heard once. Like, is that a smart idea? And I don't think it is like and that's well, that's the tough part. Well, work with me here. So, okay. again, you know, yeah. your, your job is to keep people coming to see you. Right. Correct. That's one of the things that you do. So yes. if someone gives you a quest. Do you on mic acknowledge the request? Like, oh, I got this request for this great song. I, you know, can I sing one chorus for you? Will that, will that do it for you? Because, you know, and make it almost a joke. And, you know, something that, that doesn't alienate someone. And I, I think when I say to people, oh, I'm so sorry, we just don't know it. I don't know if they go away mad or if they go away. I, I mean, try to be nice. I think I'm being nice. Sure. But, you know, is that the best way to just be like, oh, I would if I could, but we just don't know it. Honest and direct. Is it better to acknowledge them on mic and say, oh, this really nice lady just came up and made a great request. It's a great song. Unfortunately, we don't know it. Anybody in the band know it. And, you know, even if you get one riff of the of the of the horn yeah. line or anything like that, is that better than nothing or is yeah, that you I, just derailed the show? So I think the well, that's one way to do it. I think regardless of whether you're doing it on mic or off mic, I've found the most success with, you know, when you ha- when you have to say no, it's. Uh, it's like, oh, the, the first thing I say is, oh, man, that's such a great song. Right. Yeah. So now you're acknowledging that. Yeah, we're, we're both. We would both love to hear this song right now. And and then it's but, you know, uh, some some version of we don't know it like, oh, you know, that would take a lot of work for a guitar player to, to figure out or. Uh, you know, the harmonies on that one or the vocals on that one are just beyond us or whatever it is like we don't want to ruin the song. So we're not going to do it like that. You know, some version of of we love that song, but we don't know it well enough to be able to deliver it. How about if we play something else? Right. Y- you know, and uh, and doing that on mic can be fun. And like you said, if somebody can, you know, play the riff, the hook, the whatever it is. That's usually enough to, you know, to appease someone and, and engage them. Right. That's the idea is entertaining yeah. by engaging. Yeah. And by engaging. So maybe if you, you know, you mentioned them, I, what I often say, if I do go on mic is like, oh, I, is this your favorite song? Because I do not want to mess with your favorite song. I, you know, we don't know it well enough and I don't want to put a bad memory of your favorite song in your mind. You yeah. know, so, something that's kind of self-effacingly says you're awesome. Thanks for you know caring enough to come up and talk to us. That's um, it. I, Right. That, that's kind of what we're trying to get to. Yep. Um, you're right. Acknowledge, you know, show empathy, connect and say that is a great song. Uh, uh, but that's you know. it. Like, that's as far as yeah. you get. You, you I mean, again, yeah. you want to be disingenuous about it if it's not a great song. But um, yeah, I mean, again, our job is to keep people coming to see us and, you know, connecting with them as part of it. This is, you know, I always remind you that you've given me one of the best thoughts of of how to run a band and that use your break time to thank people for coming, shake people's hands. It's been the most effective thing for getting people to follow my band. 
Yeah, this is one of those do as I say, not as I do things. I I try to do as I say as well. But, you know, and and sometimes like that request thing can be the icebreaker for you. Right. Like I'm I'm I know it seems like I'm a a personable guy and and, and certainly I, I like having conversations with people, but I am not the one that will start up conversations with people. That's just not who I am. Um, but I know that. It, like like we've said on the show before, the break time is exactly the time where you should be doing exactly that. You know, it's you don't actually take a break. You're just not playing. And uh, if someone comes up with a request and it's something I think we might be able to do, another answer I give them is, ooh, not this set, but maybe next set. Right. So now that does two things. Number one, it says we're we're listening to you. We're paying attention. The other thing it says is you need to stick around for the next set. And, and then if it is something I think we can pull off, like we did, we had somebody request brown eyed girl at a recent fling gig and it's not a song that fling has played before. I've played it with two of the other members of fling at different times, but as a band, we've never played it. And you had a quorum. Yeah, I knew. And plus it was like, I, yes, I know a guitar player knows this song and our bass player knows this song. So it's like, okay, no problem. Like we can, we can fake our way through this. The other guys can either not play or fake their way and and it'll be (laughs) fine. And, and so I went up to the the woman as we were heading back to the stage. I'm like, Hey, thanks so much for that request. I'm going to see if we can fit it in. What's your name? And, you know, and then that way I could thank her from stage and and make this thing. And and we did. We opened the set with Brown Eyed Girl and she, oh, she and her friends were so happy. They came up and danced and then we kept them up for a while. So it was good, you know, but um, but yeah, yeah. Requests are it, it's great, right? Because it means people are comfortable talking to you, which means you've somehow opened that door or the booze at the bar has opened the door. But, you know, like they, the the fact that people don't feel like you're alienating them, that's a really good thing. And so, like you said, you don't want your response to be the thing that alienates them. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. It's tough though. I don't, it's tough. Yep. Well, you know what? Maybe it's not tough if you put yourself in the right frame of mind, right? So if, sure. if the right frame of mind, because again, the even if it's nothing more like, oh, that is a great song. I love that song. Unfortunately, the band doesn't know it. You may have accomplished what you want. Right. You connected, you know, you 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 bonded for a moment. You let the person know that you're approachable, you know, come up and talk to me anytime. And and uh and maybe you've accomplished that, hey, you know, like many things, it's a matter of personal style yes. and, and uh, you know, the, the million different variables in any particular situation. I mean, someone comes up and requests, you know, something for rush or, you know, yeah, you know, then they're just being silly, right? Then they're just being silly. Yeah. And, but and sometimes, it's silly fun. Just be like, sometimes it's fun to turn those back around on them and deliver, but um, yeah, 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 yeah. But one thing I like to say is if, you know, especially if we're inviting requests, which sometimes we will, you know, especially on acoustic gigs where it's a little more flexible and you can get away with a verse and a chorus and be done, you know, with a tune and and, and that sort of thing. Uh, I, what I'll say is, you know, if John says, and yeah, we'd love to take your request, we'll see what we can do. We can't promise we can do the exact song, but we might be able to get something by your favorite band. And then I always follow that up with uh and if we can't play something by your favorite band, we guarantee you will play something that your favorite band has heard before. So yeah, <laughs> just, I don't know. It's something to do. Clever. Uh, yeah. But that's what, right. But that's the thing. And then that, you know, I've always said the one great device to use to engage the crowd or to show the crowd that you are engageable is to keep your jokes between yourselves on stage, between band members on stage on the mic. And that I learned from watching Bowling for Soup 10 years ago. And because those guys are cutting up constantly with each other and they're not, I mean, Jarrett Reddick is, could be, and is a stand-up comedian. Like he's really, really got, like timing and everything. He, he really knows what he's doing, but so much of what those guys do that actually is entertaining is them just messing with each other. Like we musicians do like anyone does like any group of friends does, but they do it on the mic. And, mm-hmm. uh, and I remember the first monkey fist gig I had after I sort of this dawned on me and we did it. And it was like, oh, my gosh, like this is this is entertaining. People were like, you guys were really fun tonight. It's like, yeah, it's like fourth wall thing. Yeah, we've ha- we've been having that fun on stage every time we just, you know, hide it from the mics. It's like, wait a minute. Why? Some things you should hide from the mics, folks. Use discretion. <laughs> However, you know, not everything. And you can really have fun, you know, and bring people into your world, which is really kind of the point. Fun stuff. We have time for more. 
do you uh i mean we have uh we have all kinds of stuff we could go into what what do you think we uh no, we, i think we, let's wrap it up for this week and, and then, then get through the holiday weekend and bring back some good gig sto- gig war stories for there the you go yeah 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 cool <laughs> Well, folks, thank you so much for listening. As always, as I said before, feedback at giggabpodcast.com. That is, we would love to hear from you. Tell us your request stories. Tell us your tips, right? Like we shared a lot of tips in this episode. Uh, we love it when you share your tips that we can then echo to the, uh, to, the, to the audience here. Everybody gets to learn and that's a beautiful thing. So We're all in it together. We're all in it together. That's the, that's the idea. There's no fourth wall. We just kind of funnel it through here every week. And in a sense, that's like performing, isn't it, Paul? Always. Always. Yeah. 